today, I invite you to remain seated, but look at the screen in front of you. Any of you know what that tree is called? Pando. It is a pando tree. And it is, that is its scientific name anyway. And it is considered to be the largest organism on earth. And it's found in Utah. It's on my bucket list of places to go. But there's something fascinating about the pando tree. That whole forest that you see there is a single tree. One tree, 47,000 branches, one tree. And it is considered one tree because they're all part of the same root system. So while they may look individual, they are all come from one root. So may it be for us. So may it be for us as a community of faith. Though we are individual and we stand alone, may we always remember that we are rooted. We are rooted in the love of Christ. We are rooted in this extravagant welcome that God provides to everyone. And as we worship today, lifting our individual voices together, may we never forget that we are rooted as one. May it be so. Amen. I invite you now to stand as your able in body and our spirit for our gathering hymn, Holy Ground, and we will be singing it twice.
more about a parable that is sometimes very difficult to read and very difficult to understand. But I ask that you be with me and may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is one of those texts, this is one of those stories that I have wrestled with for the last couple of weeks. And I'm in a group of clergy on Facebook who are doing this same lectionary series that we're doing here. And one of them posted this morning, I don't know about any of you, but I'm stepping into the pulpit today exhausted from wrestling with this text for so long. And I feel like the text won. It is hard to read this story. It is hard to tell this story, and it's even harder to discern what it is the story is saying to us today. But it's an important story, and it's a passage of Scripture that's been used over time to give justification for all kinds of atrocities. This is a story that has been used, and I think taken out of context, to promote violence against our Jewish siblings. It is a passage of scripture that has been used in many cases to justify crusades against our Muslim siblings. It has sadly been a text that has been taken out of context and used against our LGBTQIA plus siblings. There's so much violence in this passage. There's so much what seems to be hate in this passage. And there are so many pastors, myself in years past included, who have simply explained this text by just scratching the surface without going any deeper. And when we do that, it looks so simple. It looks so easy to understand what it is that Jesus is trying to say with the parable that we're going to read today. But beware of anyone that tells you any parable of Jesus is simple, because it's not. They're not designed to be simple. They're not designed to have just one meaning. As I've shared with you multiple times, you may read the same parable three times and three times see and hear something different. I started out on a journey several years ago of deconstructing or unlearning, as I like to say, many of the harmful theology that I learned as I was growing up, and even as I was in a very conservative undergraduate seminary. And so because of that commitment to deconstructing passages like this give me great anxiety. Passages like this really cause me a lot of stress. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go into the passage and I'm going to read it all and then we'll go back and we will have some discussion. But it's Matthew chapter 12 verses 1 to 14. The heading in many Bibles has the heading as the parable of the wedding banquet. But Jesus also told them other parables. He said the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, the feast has been prepared, the bulls and fattened cat cattle have been killed, and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guest he had invited ignored them and went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious, and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited are worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servant brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet, to meet with the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, 
How is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, Bind his hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. That is not an easy passage. When I committed to teaching and preaching through the narrative lectionary, I committed to following the narrative lectionary and not skipping over things that may be difficult. So today I invite you into maybe a different hearing or a different understanding of this particular parable. Because you see, I am a believer and I try my best to be a practitioner of what is called liberation theology. And liberation theology is this idea of reading, interpreting, and teaching scripture through the lens of the oppressed, through the lens of the poor, through the lens of those who we consider to be on the margins. And in reading and interpreting and teaching and preaching passages of scripture, as a liberation theology believer, I have to ask myself, how does this passage sound to someone who is poor? Of which, by the way, 47% of people who live in Florida are poor or low income. So how does this passage sound to them? <laughs> and so in doing that, as I have explained in years past, I've always assumed and believed that the king represented God and the son represented Jesus and there was this big banquet and people were invited but people didn't come and God and God's wrath got so upset and sent out other people and started inviting other people and on and on and on. I have been taught in the past that the messengers were considered to be the prophets that were sent to the Jews and the Jews rejected them and that is why I said earlier that this passage so often has been used to justify atrocities against our Jewish siblings. That throwing somebody into, binding someone's hands and throwing them into a place where there is weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, it doesn't sound like the God that I believe in. So I struggle with that. And then after a lot of prayer and a lot of wrestling, I thought, what if this passage is not about God? What if this passage is about us? What if this passage, the king, represents the church? What if we are the ones that invite people to come, and they may come, and they may not, but when people do come, if they don't look a certain way, or act a certain way, or believe a certain way, or they don't conform to our way of doing things, we disregard them. What if this story is about us? Because there are times that we have to admit we are the king in this story. We prepare, we do all these things, and we invite people to come, but invitation doesn't always mean inclusion. Invitation does not always mean acceptance. If you don't believe that, ask anyone who has been asked to leave a community of faith. Oh, you're welcome. How many times have we heard that? You're welcome to come. And you're encouraged to give and tithe. But that's it. Your service in the church can go no further than that. This king in this story already shamed because he had this big wedding banquet planned and the people that he invited didn't come. And so he has to go out and invite the undesirables to come. He's already shamed and then he walks in and he throws somebody out because they weren't dressed for a wedding <coughs> feast. Well, maybe they weren't dressed for a wedding feast because they weren't going to a wedding 
feast when they left the house. Did you see in the story that he sent his messengers out, his servant out, to get people from the street corners and bring them in? They were not ready to go to a wedding feast. That would be the equivalent of me dressed like I usually dress to go to the grocery store, which is far from how I would dress to go to a wedding party and be invited in and be asked to leave because I wasn't dressed appropriately. That is a perfect analogy for what happens time and time and time again in communities of faith all over the place. We invite people in, and then if they don't meet the standard, they're asked to leave. And then the last part of that whole story, the last part about many are called and few are chosen, that is a verse that has been used and misused time and time again to justify all kinds of atrocities. But what if that's not a, just a statement? What if that sentence is an indictment? What if that statement Jesus is saying to his followers is that God calls many, but few are chosen? And what if that has less to do with the call and more with the people that are doing the choosing? Because when I read this anew the last couple of weeks, I thought about the number of women who are called to ordain ministry, but how few are chosen because of denominational guidelines or whatever. I think about the number of LGBTQIA plus folks that are called and how few are chosen. The calling is there, but communities of faith are so often unwilling to choose them. And I'm specifically thinking about our transgender siblings and how difficult it is for them, even though the calling is there, God has called them finding a community of faith that will allow them to live into the call that God has placed on their life is very hard, if not impossible, to find. So rather than this story being about God and God's wrath against those, what if we imagine it's more about us and our treatment of each other our treatment of those on the margin, our treatment of those who are poor and needy. And what if it's more about this place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? What if it's more about us not casting out people into a dark place where there is weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth and closing our ears to their pain and to their suffering, but opening up our doors and realizing that many are called, and this is a place where you certainly can be chosen. May that be our prayer. Amen. I invite you now to stand as your able in body and or spirit for our sermon hymn. Here I am, Lord, and we'll be singing verses 1 and 3. <laughs> 